Okay, we're going to get rolling here. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Disney McLean University. Uh, I'm your host, Jim Huseman. Uh, we got an exciting class for you today. It's over automatic control valves. Uh, with us and presenting is Paul Denson from Watts ACV. Uh, if you've got any questions during the class, please use the chat feature in the bottom right uh, corner of this program. We'll answer each question in turn at the end. And uh, as always, at the conclusion of the class, I'll send you your ASPE CEU via email. Uh, so without any further delay, I'll pass this on to Paul. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> in this class, we're going to talk about ACVs, what are they, where they're used. Uh, we'll go over um, a little bit of sizing, uh, but not much. But feel free to uh, ask any questions you would like that we can cover. And then if you'd like further information, we'd be glad to send that to you as well. Uh, so here we go. The first thing we're going to talk about is what is an ACV. ACV is an automatic control valve. Um, we have to realize that it is pilot operated regulator. It's a diaphragm valve used for regulating pressure flow level or on and off applications. Uh, actuated by line pressure and operated by hydraulic control pilots. The neat thing about control valves or ACVs is if you see the red valve there, that is the basic valve or what I refer to as the workhorse. That valve as it sits can do nothing and without these pilots and tubing, the valve is just an expensive spool piece. ACV in itself is a very configurable product. Um, as of right now, as far as I'm aware, there are 2,357 different variations of how we pipe this thing to make it do just that many different things. So main valve options when we look at it, we look at sizes inch and a quarter through 16 inch full port and three through 24 inch reduced port. Uh, as far as the patterns, we do, they do come globe and angle, body materials, ductile iron uh, is a standard. Stainless steel is available if we, uh, if we need it uh, for any application. In connections, as far as, uh, as how we hook these things up, they're threaded and flanged. ANSI uh, flanges 150 pound and 300 pound flanges. And we also do have a new product launch to where we offer grooved in valves. Um, and that is through all size ranges there uh, that we have the grooved in valves. Rubber materials as a standard is Buna N. Uh, EPDM and Viton is available if we get into the situation to where uh, we need those or require those at no extra charge. We can switch those elastomers out for you and uh, make sure you get the elastomer of your choice. Um, as far as features, we look at uh, stainless steel main valve trim as a standard, NSF listed fusion bonding epoxy coating um, through the whole valve. So the whole valve assembly itself, of course, is uh, NSF approved. And with all of the low lead transformation and the NSF 61 NXG, uh, as far as the low lead, we are one of the only manufacturers that are pouring low lead bronze here in the U.S. and uh, offer a complete low lead assembly uh, when it comes to the valves as they ship. So if we look at a little getting into the valves and understanding how they work, if we look at the flow direction in the arrow, we have to understand that in most applications, the valves are going to flow under the seat and the valves will fail open. Unless specified otherwise, in every domestic water system, this is how the valve is going to operate. If we flow over the seat, the valve is closed. These have to be specified specifically if that's what you want the valve to do. Uh, and at that point, we would ask you to consider a little bit different valve, maybe a double chamber valve, uh, in which we would go into further detail about. These applications are common sometimes in industrial applications or fueling um, where whatever substance we're moving through the valve, 
uh, we do not want to continue to flow. So we will we will fill those valves in a closed position. When we look at installations and we talk about how these things go in, the rhyme and reason as to why, when we look at valves that are installed horizontally, we have no issues with. Okay, we love to see valves installed in the horizontal position. When we look at installing valves vertically, there's a lot of things that we have to uh, take in consideration and look at. When you install a valve vertically, it is not recommended for valves to be installed vertically eight inches and larger. If we get into the ACV itself, a lot of the in internals tend to get very heavy. And what happens is on closure, that valve does not get a chance to seat all the way and actually can have some leak by. So if you do have a valve that you want to install in vertically, we need to know so we can specify heavier cover springs to assist on closing, uh, and then just make you aware of things that could happen. Uh, most of these valves go in and go to work and hopefully don't have to be repaired. If they do, a valve in a vertical installation, of course, would be much more difficult to maintenance. Uh, and we could look at premature wear on the stem and the, and the seat and the guide bushings there. And we, it's always good to uh, make sure that you make the manufacturer aware if you're installing anything vertically so we can make sure that we can assist you um, with that application. Please, 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 please do not ever mount a valve upside down. Um, these valves work with pressure in and out of the top cover there above that diaphragm and will be very difficult to make this valve function uh, in an upside down installation. Very interesting chart. A lot of questions that we get from engineers uh, and, and building owners is, where do we use an ACV versus a WPRV? And if you look at the chart here, we look at our flow and our outlet pressure. So if we look at function, sizes, in connections, performance, pressure in line and set, and options, we look at every time we size a valve, we always ask what are your minimum flows, what are your normal flows, and what are your maximum flows? Sometimes we will recommend that you use a WPRV and not an ACV. When we get into sizing ACVs versus WPRVs, there's one thing that we really have to keep in mind. Just because we have a two inch or a four inch line in a building, if it's in a retrofit situation or new construction, it doesn't always mean that we need a valve that is two or four inches. So if we look at the chart and we see the difference in fall off, the red line there is a direct acting PRV. So you can see at 50 PSI, or excuse me, 50 PSI, the more volume we try to move through that, at that amount of PSI, you can see the fall off is pretty drastic. And then doing that, we lose a lot of gallons per minute and could not be able to supply the desired GPM for fixtures or if it's in a commercial application or industrial application for mixers or anything else. If we look at an ACV, we take the same size ACV and that fall off, it's a huge, huge difference on that maximum flow. So we can see that we get uh, almost 100 gallons more per minute through that ACV than we do that direct acting PRV. And these curves and this fall off gets greater as the size goes up. So a lot of these ACVs, when we get up into larger sizes, can flow an extreme amount of water. Uh, just a quick example, we look at a four inch ACV, a four inch ACV can flow up to almost 800 gallons per minute. Um, so just to give you an idea, that, that's a tall drink of water when we get into um, doing that. This is just an old snapshot of, of a commercial uh, building 
and what we see typically. Now, keep in mind 99.9% .9 of everything that we sell in a commercial building as far as an ACV is one of two valves. It's a pressure reducing valve or an excess pressure shutoff valve. All right, but just to give you a couple of examples as to where ACVs can be used uh, if the application permits itself, we can have a pressure reducing valve, we can have a pressure reducing valve with surge control feature, we can have a flood protection shutdown valve, which is very, very common these days um, in the basements of buildings and, and a lot of high rises where you have a backflow preventer and you have a potential for uh, backflow failure and dump. Uh, we have a pressure relief valve, high, high pressure safety shutoff valve with downstream expansion relief, uh, your simple on and off float valves, and pressure reducing valves with hydraulic check features, uh, which works as a pump control valve. So just a quick snapshot of a commercial building that may have multiple tendons, or uh, maybe it's just an office building, but a lot of these uh, valves could be utilized in this application. So we'll talk about the most common of the valves that are installed and specified, and that would be the pressure reducing valve. So a pressure reducing valve reduces fluctuating high inlet pressure to a consistent and constant outlet pressure. So regardless of the fluctuation that we're getting from the incoming side, this valve is designed to maintain that constant pressure downstream. It has a broad flow range and a large adjustment range. So when we look at the flow range on a, let's just say a four inch ACV, we're looking at 30 gallons per minute up to 600, 700, sometimes pushed to the max almost 800 gallons per minute. So it's an extremely broad flow range. The pilots, as far as adjustment, we're looking at 30 to 300. So it's very important to understand what that pilot is and what it does. I always tell folks in training that we're gonna go out to the lab and we're gonna adjust some of these valves. Do not be the guy that walks up to the valve and just starts turning on the pilot. In this situation with this pilot, if you went up in a live system and took three turns on that pilot, you just injected 96 PSI into your system, right? So a lot of times systems cannot hold that pressure, and with that adjustment range, it's very, very important that you know what you're doing um, when you do that. The neat thing about these valves is they're very configurable. So you remember I told you how you have that red box or that blue box that you see there, and then you have the tubing with the pilots. Some valves could have three or four pilots on it, single pilots, solenoids. We can configure and help you with your application with many different valves. So we like to pride ourselves on being a solution provider instead of just a me too valve. So any application that you have that you're questioned with or you need a multifunction, we can do that and, uh, and be able to help you there. But it gives you an idea of what you're looking at when you get a, um, a pressure reducing valve from us, uh, from the factory. If we look at the schematic and go over it right quick, um, as we're coming out of the valve and we look at number three, number three there, of course, is going to be our, uh, our strainer. And every valve will come with a strainer with a 40 mesh um, Y strainer, just like we need oxygen to breathe, these pilots have to have uh, flow to them to operate and balance out the bigger main valve. That pilot system is the brain, and the, the valve itself is the workhorse. And if we come around, we can see that the pilot there is sensing the downstream side. It's hooked into the downstream side, sensing that downstream pressure. And of course, there's a couple numbers missing there. But if we look at the other device that has the black cap on it with the T, that is an opening speed control or a flow control, which is very important to eliminate water hammer. Uh, we can control how fast these valves open when they're called to open. When you have a valve that's in a low flow situation, 
you don't want the valve to open too quickly and cause that water hammer. So we can adjust that to control the speed of the opening and make sure that the valve is tuned in um, in the application that it's installed. Okay, I got ahead of myself, I apologize. Here is the, um, here's the example of, of what that is. Now, the neat thing that I will tell you uh, is we love to get folks up to uh, North Andover in Boston and give a full-blown ACV training class. That training class is designed um, just specifically for ACVs, but there are many other classes that are offered as far as backflow. And getting up there, it's hands-on, and you can understand exactly how these things work, the rhyme, the reason. You'll actually have to pipe one, build one, and adjust it. Um, we bring engineers into that facility from all over the world uh, to teach them about products. The one thing that I did not cover when we looked at this is that red orifice. Um, these valves work with how we put water on and take water off the cover. Um, it's how we make these valves function. Uh, and we can go into that in, in a little bit more detail later on. But that orifice is very important. A lot of times I'll get contractors to call and say, I took this red bushing out and the valve won't do anything. Good, put that red bushing back in because there's an orifice in it and it's not just uh, a 90. So we'll move on from the pressure reducing valve. And if you have any questions, please please put them there in the chat and we'll go back and, and answer those questions when it comes to pressure reducing. To give you an understanding of the pilot, as I stated, the pilot is the brain. It controls the pressure in the cover. Uh, in this case, it is a direct acting regulator or a WPRV that is attached to a larger valve which tells that valve what to do, okay? It does have a uh, adjusting bolt, so if you screw it in, it increases the pressure. You screw it out, it decreases the pressure. Gives you a little exploded view there of the pilot itself. The adjustable speed control uh, on a pressure reducing valve, unless specified otherwise, it's gonna be an opening speed control. We can, in fact, put a closing speed control in there as well. Um, and that, that is common for some engineers to install both, but it slows the speed of response of the main valve. It's a controlled flow in one direction, free flow in the other, uh, and it gives us the opportunity to slow that down and stabilize that system so we can control how fast that valve opens and calm that valve down so it don't overshoot itself. Our orifice, which we talked about, restricts the flow to the cover of the pilot. Without the orifice, the pilot can flood the main valve and will close the valve, and of course the valve will not open at all. So it's very important that we keep that orifice or that red bushing uh, in that configuration. When we look at where do we use these valves, any place where the main line pressure is above the desired system pressure. Give an example, if you have 80 PSI on the street, and you want 50 PSI into the building, we can put this coming into the building to reduce that street pressure to the building. Uh, 100 PSI from a booster pump going to a floor, and you only want 50 PSI when we tee off and go to the floor. We put these in there, depending on the GPMs, uh, we can size you a valve that will make sure that at all times you're reducing that pressure and that you have the 50 PSI uh, that is desired. How many floors are controlled by one ACV? Well, it depends on the building design. Um, if a floor is about 10 feet, then the pressure change per floor is about 4.5 PSI. So as we're walking down a commercial building, depending on how many floors we're going, depending on how many zones we're gonna control, sometimes one valve will control three, four, five floors, depending on what the fixtures are set to handle and what pressure is desired on each floor. So that really depends on the design and um, what we're trying to accomplish. When we go to sizing valves, it's very important that we get these questions answered to help us better size the valve that you need. 
if we can get the inlet pressure, the desired outlet pressure, differential pressure is very important for us, minimum flow, normal flow, and max flow. These valves require a pressure differential of a minimum of 7%. I personally like to see 10 so we can stay away from the bubble, but we have to have a minimum of 7 PSI differential for these valves to work. If we have this information here, we can make sure that unless the system parameters change, you have a valve that will work in your application and be a workhorse for you and not let you down. The other neat thing that is coming to Watts is we're working very hard and spending a lot of hours and dollars on, con on creating a configurator. So in this configurator, we'll send out a mass email and you can sign up to be a part of the configurator. And in that configurator, you'll be able to go in and input your data. It will give you the valve size, the flow rate. It'll tell you if cavitation may occur, please contact the factory. It'll also give you a printable budgetary number as an engineer. And it will also give you a printable um, schematic. It'll also give you a submittal and a specification sheet that can all be printed right there from your desk. So we're working hard to make it easier for, for you guys to be able to reach out and get that information as needed. But it's also recommended that you stay in contact with your local experts here at Disney. McLean and be able to have that one-on-one -on -one contact as well. But you'll definitely have the information. We're looking to launch that here before Christmas so we can put a bow on it and send it out to everybody uh, and be able to get some feedback on it. When we look at the sizing chart and the high flow sizing, um, we look at if we're flowing, this, this chart is set up for 300 gallons per minute at, at 50 uh, PSI differential, so we look at pressure drop and we look at flow rate. Uh, of course, we can see if we're going to flow uh, 250 gallons per minute at 50 PSI, then we need approximately an inch and a quarter uh, valve. So pretty self-explanatory when it comes to the flow charts, and we can get you uh, all the flow charts that you need uh, if required, or if you want to wait to the configurator and make it easier. We can do that as well. Here's just a few quick numbers here. Um, if we look at uh, the gallons per minute, uh, we looked at the maximum continuous flow, as I mentioned, on a four inch being 800 gallons per minute. Just kind of gives you an idea, an idea, a CV factor, uh, minimum flow rate uh, per valve. So this chart is very, very helpful for you when we when we go to looking at sizing basic single chambered valves, okay? And all these valves here on this is full port uh, valves, and I'll explain the difference at the end between a full port and a um, reduced port valve. When we look at sizing considerations, we also have to uh, make sure that we understand cavitation. And I like to explain cavitation like this. Cavitation is the extrusion of oxygen from the water. So imagine riding a bike in the mountains. And if you're on top of the hill, we'll call that atmospheric pressure. And if you ride the bike down the hill, and once you get to the bottom of the hill, you can kind of feel a difference in your chest, your breathing, that I refer to as subatmospheric pressure. And as you're going back up the hill and you're struggling there to get up, you get to the top of the hill and you get back to atmospheric pressure, and then your breathing changes, your body changes. That is exactly what happens coming through the, through the valve. So as we're coming in through the valve, you drop from atmospheric to subatmospheric pressure. And as you go over the seat of the valve, it's introduced back into atmospheric pressure. So in the seat of the valve is where cavitation occurs. And what happens is 
those, when the oxygen separates itself from the water, these small bubbles are formed. When these bubbles are formed, they don't explode, they implode. And when they implode, they take everything, they come in contact with it. Doesn't matter if it's stainless steel, hastaloid, ductile iron, aluminum, nickel, bronze, it doesn't matter. It is detrimental to anything that it touches. So as we look at that, a good rule of thumb, if we look at the chart here, is that if we have a 60% drop in pressure, you're going to have cavitation. So not all the time does high pressure mean you're going to have cavitation. If you've got a valve and you've got 400 PSI and you're reducing from 400 to 300, you're not going to have cavitation. However, if you have a 60% drop in pressure, you're going to have cavitation. If we have a relief valve that's going 80 PSI to atmosphere, we're going to have cavitation. Okay? So, good rule of thumb, 60% drop in pressure, we're going to have cavitation. So, is there a solution for cavitation? There is. No one can eliminate cavitation, but we can dissipate cavitation when it occurs. As you see in the photo, that is what we refer to as our anti-cavitation trim. That replaces the seat of the valve. There's lambda flow around that cage, and it allows those bubbles to be pushed to the center of the cage and dissipate upon itself and not on the valve, which in return will, will damage the valve. We can also combat cavitation as if we reduce the pressure in stages with two valves. So if we have a high drop and we want to take it in two stages, three stages, we can do that as well. Not a problem. Um, and just to give you an example, there was a fish hatchery in Washington State that was taking 280 PSI and going to atmosphere in a 36-inch butterfly valve. <clears throat> and he wanted to know why every 45 to 60 days he had to buy a new butterfly valve. So he ordered an ACV and didn't tell us about the cavitation. 36-inch valve is not cheap. We're talking over 100 grand. So he gets it up there, he puts it in, puts it to work, doesn't call anybody. In 45 days, there's a hole through the side of the valve that a grown man could step through. So after wasting several hundreds of thousands of dollars on the hatchery, um, he called us. We were able to give him an anti-cavitation cage, and in that situation, he got eight years out of the valve instead of 45 days. So it didn't last a lifetime, but it gave him eight years of solution versus 45 days. So please, if you know you're going to have cavitation, these valves will not last. If you let us know, give us the opportunity to provide a solution, we can get you a valve that works. Other sizing considerations is static versus dynamic pressure. The valve shuts off at a static pressure. Flowing is dynamic. That's very, uh, very important to remember. Uh, a lot of times when we shut these valves off, they do have a small pressure creep that gets trapped in the gauge, and a lot of people say, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's creeping up. We've got to understand that when it closes off at a static pressure, we're going to have a little bit of, 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 of increase, but not much. Intermittent flow, specify a valve with both opening and closing speed controls. If the valve is not going to be in a continuous flowing state, if it's just opening and closing and supplying pressure intermittently, we need to be able to control how fast that valve opens, how fast it closes, and be able to help you uh, stop that uh, from occurring. Parallel installations. Uh, used for wide ranging and flow demands where one valve cannot adequately control uh, or cover all conditions. This is very common in low flow conditions. So we use a 115-74, which is a factory built parallel installation on a single valve. In my opinion, and this is an opinion, 
I will never put a pressure reducing valve in without having a low flow bypass in it, especially in a commercial application. In a commercial application, everybody comes into work, they're making coffee, they're, they're using the restrooms, some buildings have showers, there's a lot of flow during the day. At night, when you have one or two people in the office, the, the environmental janitorial staff is there, there may be flushing toilets here and there, and we have the very minimum flow. If we have a four inch ACV, it's not gonna supply that one to two gallons a minute. But in the photo there, you see two pilots. What we do is on the other side of the valve, we will hang off a 223 direct acting PRV that will handle the low flow. We will set it 10 PSI different than the ACV, and once that direct acting cannot keep up, it allows the ACV to open up and supply the flow that you need. So when we talk about minimum versus maximum flow and getting that data, it's very, very important. Please, I get a lot of phone calls that says, my valve doesn't work properly. What size valve do you got? I've got a two inch valve. How many gallons per minute are you moving? Uh, maybe four. We have to go out, send a repiping kit, and put a direct acting valve off the other side. Fantastic valve, in my opinion, in a pressure reducing application where you know low flow is possible, I would never sell a valve without a Dash 74. Here's a few parallel installations that we're looking at, um, just so you get an idea of what we're talking about. Of course, here we're showcasing uh, some angle pattern valves and some stainless steel valves. Um, I, would, I would love to sell everything in stainless steel, but uh, of course we, we want to be economically friendly as well. Uh, and it, just to let you guys know that if you have flange dimensions in a parallel installation, we build factory valve stations. So these stations are custom built for each application. Uh, we can maintain a valve without shutting off downstream pressure and doing this. It allows us to have that bypass for maintenance. Um, if we know we've got issues or we know that um, we're gonna be shutting systems down and doing this, we can put in a parallel installation so we can make sure that the building uh, or whatever application it is has flow at all times. And these can be uh, done on site and ordered in pieces, or they can be factory assembled and just put in and drop and flange bolted together. So very neat thing that we do here um, at our factory in Woodland, California. 115-7, pressure reducing valve with down seam uh, surge control. Starting to see quite a few of these valves. Um, it does have a pressure reducing function. Uh, the other function is it drives the valve shut in a rapidly decreasing flow application. Um, the dash seven is a surge function. So where would we use this? Any place where uh, there's high demand on and off applications, uh, maybe on a floor where we have a laundry room, um, the surge pilot number three drives the valve shut. Uh, if high demand or it rapidly shuts off, because we know as we look at the transients that if we have a rapid shut off, what happens to the water? It just stands in place, right? Absolutely not. It keeps going, and just like the rubber band, when it reaches its point, it will snap and come back, and when it comes back, it comes back 10 times greater or more than it left, uh, and when we have that, and we have that surge or that transit, it's very detrimental to everything um, in the building, including the ACV. So um, I'll give you a quick story about that. San Antonio water, um, we were, we were um, at San Antonio and they had 24 inch pump control valves and it lost the power 
they were having a surge. And when it left the plant, it was leaving at about 460 PSI. And when it would come back, it literally would take a valve and shatter it into pieces. So when we did the transient study, it was coming back and it was hitting the valve at over 2,400 PSI. It actually took a pump and raised it up out of the concrete about six feet. And we're talking about 400 horsepower pumps. So transients are very strong. And in the area that you know you're gonna have uh, an on and off application, it may be important that you look at the downstream uh, surge control. One of my favorite valves that um, is gaining a lot of traction in the market is the 113 RFP, flood protection device. So we know without a shadow of a doubt that a backflow preventer has a relief valve for a reason. And we all also understand that all of the water systems around here in the building maintenance systems have absolutely no trash in it and we have the cleanest water in America. That's not true either. So what happens when a backflow preventer catches a piece of trash, the relief valve opens and the backflow preventer dumps. Depending on the size of backflow, this could create havoc inside a building. If a backflow opens up and it's dumping 600 gallons per minute, let's just say, even if we've done our calculation on containment hours and we have a pump, then we still, as we know, can flood a mechanical room. So the 113 RFP monitors the backflow and closes when the backflow is doing its job. And the way we do that is we have the flow switch into a drain, and that flow switch is hooked to the relief valve with an air gap of the backflow preventer. The ACV is before the backflow preventer, and that flow switch is wired to a solenoid. So it's just an on and off valve application. When that flow switch sees a dump, then it'll send a signal to the solenoid and close the main valve and shut the water off to the building. In doing so, it will send an alarm to the building automation system or it will even ring a bell and I'll let the maintenance guy or the building engineer know that, hey, we have a problem in zone one, our backflow preventer has went down, the valve is shut, there's no water on the building, you have to go and address this issue. This valve has to be manually reset. They cannot sit behind a computer and hit a switch and open this valve back. They have to address the problem before they can open and restore the water in this. So. You may be tired of stories, but let me tell you a quick story that, that happened in Atlanta. In 96, they built the, the Olympic Fountain. When they built the Olympic Fountain, they built it over a mechanical room that operated the MARTA train system in downtown Atlanta. They did not have a flood protection device on two six-inch backflow preventers running through this mechanical room. In this mechanical room were switchboards and many other fiber optic lines that would run the MARTA train system. The two backflow preventers caught a piece of trash and dumped and flooded the room. The city of Atlanta picks up the phone and calls Watts and says, your backflow preventer failed and now we have a catastrophic failure. In this vault, there was a metal door that dumped out onto the MARTA track and there was so much water in there that was running out onto the track and shorted out every piece of electronics that was in that room. The city of Atlanta not only had to buy flood protection devices because it wasn't our fault, but they also had to spend four and a half million dollars replacing switchboards and shorted out electrical equipment that controlled the MARTA system. Now the city of Atlanta will not put in a backflow preventer inside a room, building, or vault that does not have a flood protection device on it. 
So very good valve to where um, being able to control that dump is preferred. Washington, D.C., the Pentagon, um, all these places uh, are now installing these flood protection devices. Here is just a quick example of one that's installed. Um, I will tell you, I'm sorry, I forgot. That, that box there has a timer in it, and it set, you can set it for 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. You can set that timer for however long you want. So when that flow switch sees water and it closes that circuit, it has that time delay before it closes the valve. We do realize that during pressure surges that these backflow preventers do spit, and we don't want the valve to close down just at a spit. So we will up that time and make sure that it does not close just in an intermittent spit that happens in the backflow preventer. So when we look at commercial applications and we compare the 116 and the 116 BYR, the safety device used in any place where high upstream pressure could cause damage, right? The 116 is a pressure relief valve. The 116 BYR is a pressure shutdown valve. The pressure relief valve has to be installed in an area where it can vent to atmosphere. It opens when the upstream pressure is above the set point, protects both up and downstream equipment, and can be used on the floor with a high lint pressure, requires adequate drain size for line-sized flow. This valve will dump some water, okay? Uh, it's typically found on pump skids, and on the downstream side of pumps in order to make sure that it relieves that overpressure. Another good rule of thumb, just like cavitation, when we're sizing a relief valve, take the line size and divide by four. You're not wanting to dump the system, you're just wanting to merely relieve the overpressure. So make sure that we take that line size and divide by four. Excess pressure shutdown valve, Closes when the upstream pressure is above a set point, protects downstream equipment, and can be used on a floor with higher pressure. It does require a drain. It relieves via the pilot system, but it's only going to dump maybe two gallons a minute instead of a, excuse me, two gallons, period, versus a, um, a full dump on a relief valve. This valve also has to be manually reset or does have an option to where it resets itself and goes back to work. Um, there's a tremendous amount of these valves and, and a, lot of, a lot of towers, the PNC Tower in Pittsburgh, the Millennium Tower in Boston, um, the, the New World Trade Center and the Freedom Tower in, in New York City. A lot of these uh, excess pressure shutdown valves or safety valves are, are in a lot, of these, a lot of these buildings. Very unique product. A 110-14 on and off float valve, we won't get into great detail about a float valve, Man maintains a level in a tank, uh, it has a high and a low set point, uh, a building holding tank or cooling towers, simply works like a toilet float, can be mounted uh, either on the valve or can be remounted, mounted remotely, um, depending on the application and how you need it to be mounted, um, just a simple float valve there but wanted to cover it because it is a valve uh, that applies to applications in commercial buildings. Booster pump control valves are typically found on pump skids. Um, pump booster skids are common in commercial buildings but are usually provided by uh, an OEM supplier like Sinker Flow, Tiger Flow, um, Dakota Pump, or, or various other things. Um, so we, we look at these and, and install these. A lot of folks have gone to variable speed drives, so a lot of pump control valves are kind of going away or considered an antique nowadays. But in, in some maintenance situations, you will still find pump control valves there. And just like I stated earlier, these valves are configurable. We're using the same valve body and making it, uh, making it be a pump control valve. So just a quick overview on that. As we look over that, 
So now I wanted to go over a few questions. Um, we do have a question here on the chat that says, when would we want to use a reduced port valve instead of a full port valve? Okay, so where would we use those? Let's explain the difference between a full port and a reduced port valve. If we had two six inch valves sitting side by side, the full port valve would have a six inch flange, six inch internals, and six inch outlet. That is a full port valve. If we look at a reduced port valve in six inches, it will have a six inch inlet, four inch internals, and a six inch outlet. All right, when we look at reduced port valves, the reduced port portion of it goes down one nominal pipe size. So if you have a 12, it's a 10. If you have a 10, it's an eight, an eight's a six, a six, a four, et cetera. Now, from an engineering standpoint, in theory, Every pressure reducing valve should be a reduced port valve because you're burning energy, you want to reduce that area. However, because of flow demands and budgets, um, we look at it and 90% of everything we sell is full port valves. So where would we use those instead of a full port valve? If you go in to a building and you're doing a renovation and you're at a hospital and you're renovating a dialysis unit and the dialysis unit is going to be an office. You've had a, file, you've had a valve that was flowing two to 300 gallons a minute running a dialysis unit and now it's only merely gonna run a bathroom, a kitchen area, maybe a shower. So the demand and the flows have dropped drastically. We can't go in there and take out all of that piping and resize the piping in order to fit the, the remodel. So we go in and change the valve out, put a reduced port valve in. That four inch valve that had flows of a four inch may only now have flows of a two inch. So instead of redoing all that piping, we can change that out, put that reduced port in, always put that low flow bypass on there, that dash 74, and then we've saved a lot of cost on changing out that pipe, changing out, redoing a lot of things, and we've saved a lot of budgets um, when it comes to changing out valves and changing out systems. So uh, a very neat product um, and a very well-designed well and, and well-used product in the right application. So uh, if there's any more questions, please put them in the chat. I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, also. We would love to uh, also come to the office, do some lunch and learns in person, show you some examples, or even get you to the training facility in North Andover. Uh, in this training facility, there is tons and tons of CEU credits. The ACV class alone is 11 CEU credits, uh, and it's very hands-on, gives you a great understanding uh, of the product itself. The uh, other classes when it comes to mixing, backflow, uh, are, very, are very good classes as well. And if interested, you can email Jim, and Jim can forward you some information on the training center, uh, and we would love to see you in Boston. Other than that, I want to turn it back over to Jim. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Paul. It was a great presentation. And thank you all for joining. Um, and later this afternoon, I should be sending out Ask you CEU to each of you. Um, Again, if you don't see it, give me a call or shoot me an email. I'll get it right over to you. Uh, tune in next time. It's going to be on December 7th. We're going to be going over digital mixing valves. It's a pretty hot topic recently. Um, we'll be spotlighting the powers and telestation. So yeah, it's a class you really don't want to miss, uh, December 7th, digital mixing valve class. So thanks again, everybody, and hope to see you next time.